always that this land is and always will be Aboriginal land. I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and also to the Aboriginal people in the session today, both um, contributing and participating in the discussion. I'd also like to thank Family Safety Victoria for the funding that has enabled the centre to host this forum and a few other wellbeing, um, child wellbeing and safety webinars prior to this. We've had um, a year of work which is focused primarily on child's wellbeing and safety and strengthening practitioners' capability and confidence in working with children. So today's forum, Engaging with Children and Young People in a Safe and Meaningful Way, is just about making sure that we have a child rights lens over the work we do, making sure that we're, we're genuinely listening to what children are saying and feeling and thinking, that we're, we're capturing their perspectives and making sure that we can engage confidently and effectively with them. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our facilitator for today, Professor Kathy Humphreys. Um, Kathy is a long friend of the centre and a really passionate advocate of the work that we all do with children and families. Um, she has also originally been a social worker, which I think adds to the research that she's that she's done. Her research area around domestic and family violence, child abuse. She's internationally renowned. Um, she's been a fantastic collaborator with the centre and our sector on a, a range of different uh, research projects. Her strong interest is always in the child's experience, making sure that the impact of family violence, for example, is well understood, making sure that we understand children's experiences, that we don't forget them, making sure they're heard, they're visible, and it's such a pleasure to have her facilitate today. And I'm just going to hand over to you, Cathy. Michelle, thank you so much. What a lovely welcome. That's, that's just delightful. And, of course, I just feel so privileged to uh, have been invited into this position. Um, I so enjoy the partnership with the centre and I feel very excited that Family Safety Victoria is really seeking to put this issue on the agenda and to make it front and centre. So let me begin by also acknowledging um, that I'm on Aboriginal land and um, that wherever we are, we are all on Aboriginal land that has never been ceded. So Michelle's also asked me to um, talk for about 10 minutes on some of the research that we've also been doing at the centre, uh, sorry, at the, at the, in the social work department at University of Melbourne on child abuse um, and domestic violence. So, what to say in 10 minutes? We've all got that little challenge ahead of us. So why isn't that moving on? Okay, there we go. So clearly we just need to articulate uh, the very simple principles um, that also um, shape the agenda in this space. Children have a right to speak, not only speak, to, but, but to be heard. They've got a right to participate in whatever um, area, particularly of decision making um, that affects their lives. Um, and again, to be heard about that. They have a right to feel safe and supported. Uh, and that includes, um, and centrally, cultural safety. And they have a right to live without violence and abuse. I have to say that last one is so important in the context of domestic and family violence, which is the area in which we're speaking about. Sadly, at the moment, it's not yet in the draft agenda to end violence against women and children. I have been trying, along with many others, to advocate that it's not only gender inequality that should be up there as one of our principles, but also a child's right to live without violence and abuse makes that national plan not only a women's plan, but also um, a children's plan as well. We've got lots of examples everywhere about how we consult with children about their lived experience. This is not new territory. In fact, I remember in 2006 when I first came to Melbourne, I couldn't see Paul Nossio at um, MacKillop. He was delayed because he was consulting about how, um, with young people, about how they were going to be part and parcel of some of the decision-making at MacKillop. You know, that was back in 2006. You know, we now have... Um, the X by experience framework that was developed by Katie Lamb and um, 
and safe and equal. It is at the moment not child-centered enough and we're seeking and have been seeking some funding to make the agenda about children's lived experience um, and the standards and framework there. But we've also got Why Change, we've got Create, we've got organisations that have been working forever in this space. Um, I guess in terms of the picture, we are saying also um, that you do need to have um, age appropriate ways of consulting with children and young people. Just let me just briefly talk about three projects. You know, we've been working forever. You know, we've, we've had five projects with the Safe and Together Institute because we do think that that is the best framework for getting, for being able to work across sectors um, with a shared framework, a shared language, and a shared vision which has children living with domestic violence central to the agenda. But we also have had some wonderful projects, particularly from PhD students like Katie Lamb, Anita Morris, Gemma McGibbon, who focused all their PhD on consulting with young people. Um, Katie's work was looking at the issues in relation to how children, um, what children expect of their fathers when those children have been living with domestic and family violence. This is, I guess, the thing I wanted to emphasise in this part of the discussion and the talk is that actually children bring their own unique perspectives in these spaces that actually crystallise um, areas that we should be paying attention to. So what do children say when they're asked about their fathering and what they expected of their fathers? How different is this? from what much of the, say, the family law agenda is about in terms of post-separation visitation. Children said if they want to feel safe and they want to feel, expect, this is what they expect of their father, address the past, commit to change, rebuild trust. And they had lots of things to say in those different areas and spaces. But it is saying that, you know, you can't just magically become a fabulous father um, as soon as you separate. That doesn't work that way. These are the things that children expect. What about Anita Morris? Said some wonderful things about her exploration of children when she looked at them coming from a primary care setting, saying that actually GPs see huge numbers of children and women and men um, who are living with domestic violence or um, who are um, perpetrating domestic violence. and. These children that she recruited from primary care settings, um, so not from, I guess, the tertiary end around um, refuges, but from primary care. She said, if you want children to have agency, and this is what children spoke about when they looked at the spectrum from those that were um, doing actually quite poorly, still living with the after effects, who were still living with abuse in many ways, through to those that were showing great resilience and and feeling like they were doing well. What were the ingredients that they were looking at? They were looking at the, these four things. The awareness of destruction or danger in the parental relationship. So this is what recent research from, um, from one of the organisations in New South Wales is also showing, that many children don't know and can't name the abuse and violence they're living with, that in fact it's so normalised that they don't realise that this is actually violence and abuse. Children who are able to name it were doing much better. Physical and emotional distance from the perpetrator. These were not children in weekly visitation, in weekly time spent um, with fathers who were using violence. Modelling safety in relationships, that they had people around them who showed what respectful relationships looked like. Co-constructing family resilience. The children that were doing well were proud of their families. They had a sense that of identity for their family, which was, I've got a great mum, I've got a fantastic aunt, we do things together as a family. Life might have been tough, but we're doing well. And so there were these things that actually I think are quite unique perspectives from children about what creates resilience. This recent report, which is about to be launched next week, um, from a New South Wales organisation, also talked about children's experiences of coercive control. And what were those experiences of coercive control? Some of them look very similar to the experiences 
um, that you would get from adult survivors, but not all. Some of these are very much about children's own perspective, um, about their experiences of coercive control. Parents denying the abuse is happening when the child discloses to a third party, transferring responsibility for abusive behaviour to the child, blaming the child, threatening the child, restricting the child's environment, for example, isolating or cutting them off from friends and family and relatives, humiliating and shaming, putting them down, making the child feel bad about themselves, making the child feel crazy, playing mind games, denying food, clothing, medical care, especially as a form of punishment. So children had their own particular, you know, when the, the adults who were with lived experience were asked about their experiences as a child, they talked about their own experiences of coercive control. I guess this is about how important it is to hear the perspectives of those children, about the children's perspective on their experiences, which is, in fact, unique to them. The other thing that I really, the other important um, issue I wanted to raise was that often when we say that children have a right, <clears throat> have their own experience that needs to be heard around domestic violence, there's some notion that that means you've got to see children individually and by themselves. Actually, that's not necessarily the way to do it. Anita's experience of um, consulting with children and their mothers, and particularly with children, was that children wanted their mothers there. And that you can hear the child's experience and their own experience, as long as they're well prepared enough and the adults well prepared enough, that these children are often clinging to their mothers. They don't want to be separated from their mothers. They want their mothers to hear. So that when we talk about children have their own experience, that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be interviewed by themselves. And in fact, there needs to be a lot of work done around child and mother strengthening because the greatest gift you can give that child is actually a strengthening relationship with their non-offending parent. So just thinking about that, and I think that is a clear message from children as well that came through very strongly. What about <clears throat> Gemma McGibbon's work around um, consulting with young people who'd been through a treatment program for their harmful sexual behaviour? She consulted with them about the prevention environment, saying, okay, You've been through this treatment program. Tell us about what would have stopped you getting um, into harmful sexual behaviour. And they said three things. Well, you know, they said a lot of things. Distilled down in terms of thematic analysis was make their relationships safe and particularly address the past injustices that they've experienced. Reform their sexuality education and help them manage pornography. They just said these things very clearly as young people who um, had been involved in harmful sexual behaviour. Now that third one, the second and third ones, reform their sexuality, and reform the sexuality education, particularly in relation to consent and help them manage pornography, have been two central aspects of the Power to Kids program, which is now rolling out um, in many parts of Australia and Victoria. So all these projects. Um, which have been from children's perspectives, have really had um, their own very important leverages into informing um, the service system agenda that we're now um, working with and, I guess, would like to amplify in the works um, that we're doing. So I guess the other thing that I want to just emphasise is that working with people who've experienced um, and have the lived experience, and particularly children with lived experiences of domestic and family violence, is a two-way transactional process. That in fact, there's an enormous joy and satisfaction that those that work with children gain um, in this process. And thinking about, and when we're supervising and consulting um, our workers in this space, I know when you're hearing the experiences of harm that children experience you know, can certainly bring out um, some of one's homicidal tendencies um, because you can feel enormous anger, but you can also sense so often a wonderful experience of children's um, resilience. Um, and this is part of what 
we need to support our workforce in learning to pick up is not just vicarious trauma, but the vicarious resilience that you experience as a worker working with children when they're being given their right um, to speak and how we support them in being heard. And so just thinking about the fact there's a lot of vulnerability that we hear, but there's a lot of resilience and joy in this process of working with children and young people. So thank you, everybody. Um, I hope that's just part of a bit of scene setting in this space. Um, and I'm so looking forward to hearing from others who will want to, um, who are going to be contributing um, to our agenda today. Um, you may also, as we go along, want to be putting stuff in chat. Um, and Anna from the centre um, will be trying to pick up on those so that we can, at the end of this forum, um, have some space for questions um, as we go along. We probably won't be taking questions as we go um, because um, it's quite a packed agenda and we wanted to hear um, from everybody um, and making sure that everyone has a clear enough space to be able um, to talk and present, but we will have a bit of time at the end. So speaking of that, um, let me um, hand over to Lauren Thomas. Um, Lauren will be getting her um, presentation up. She's a senior project lead, child and youth participation engagement at the Australian Childhood Foundation. Over the past 20 years, she's worked with vulnerable and traumatised children, young people, and their network of relationships across various roles. Um, Lauren's bio um, is going to be placed in the chat. Um, so really um, welcome and looking forward to hearing from you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. As you've heard, my name is Lauren Thomas. Uh, I am coming to you from the unceded land of the Bunurong people. Uh, it's a beautiful country area, and uh, I am very grateful to their elders past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge uh, the amazing job that they have done in keeping this land that I live on. Uh, I wanted to start today's presentation as I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, participation, children and young people's participation, and thinking about it from a rights-based perspective and what it looks like when we're working with children who have experienced the trauma of family violence and abuse. Um, by just thinking about this statement, that children are vulnerable in communities that do not listen to them. I wanted to give you a moment to consider that as a statement because I think it's true, for one, <laughs> but also because I think it is also true that especially in Western culture, we spend a lot of time not listening to children. There's a lot of areas in our communities in which children are not listened to and not listened to well. So I want to give you a moment just to acknowledge that or to think about that and then to think further, to think about your community, to think about your workplace, to think about your office, and then to think about your role. The area in which your work is done are children listened to. In what ways does your workplace go out of its way to listen to children? In what ways are there systems in place that listen to children, that they go looking for the stories, the experiences, the understanding of the impact of this family violence, this domestic violence, this trauma? What, in what ways are their stories told and in what ways are they listened to? Because that, I think, is at the heart of what participative practice is looking for when it comes to this area. It's how we say that we show children that it matters. I'm gonna move from there to looking at something that I think is important for us to consider. Not only do we, do we want to give children an opportunity to participate in what's going on in, in their world because it's their right. Now, I, for one, will always tell you that because of children's rights, we want to give them an opportunity. And I think actually that's the primary driver. We, it is their right 
to participate. This is the reason that we should be giving them this opportunity. And as we know, in Victoria, we also legally need to be giving them uh, the opportunity to participate in matters that affect them. We have our um, new legislative mandate for doing that and we have a requirement to do that. But in addition to that, I think there are two other areas that we really need to keep in mind and consider when it comes to this area of work, when we're working with vulnerable children. And that is that I think we need to keep a balance between these three areas. We need to think about right, rights-based work, but we also need to think about being doing this work in a trauma-informed way. And we need to think about doing this work in an empowerment-oriented way because all three areas matter and they intersect. Children and young people who have experienced trauma might believe that they and their needs don't matter and that trauma is a part of life. I think you've heard from Kathy just before. She spoke about how the experience of abuse and violence can be so normalised that they don't even recognise it as abuse and violence. They recognise this as a normative part of life. I know I've worked with women and children for whom that's definitely true. I know I've had women who've said to me that they don't believe that relationships exist, romantic relationships exist in which there isn't violence because they've just never seen that as part of their world. Um, for children, that might mean that they have a history of feeling powerless, but, and particularly when there are decisions that are made without their input. So empowerment is a really valuable for these children and young people because it can help to restore their confidence in themselves and others, and it can assist them to take more control over their lives. Rights-based approaches are important because it helps as practitioners, but also from a systemic perspective, when we think about how we structure participation opportunities, it helps us to think about the importance of balancing protection and participation. I want that balance to also be part of the thinking. I want us to consider how do we balance those, protection and participation. I did a research project in 2019, right before the pandemic, I got back and then everything got shut down, in which I was fortunate enough to travel and I, I visited some Scandinavian countries across and then some various other countries in Europe. And I interviewed people who were working with vulnerable children in a variety of settings. And one of the consistent things that I found as barriers to children's participation was Adults' perspectives <laughs> around children needing to be protected. And what I would like to posit to all of you is that children can be both vulnerable and capable at the same time. I want you to consider that even though the children that you are working with have experienced horrible violence or trauma or abuse potentially, it does not mean that they are not also capable of having agency. And that it is, it does not mean that we need to prevent them from also being able to participate in the decisions that are being made about their life. We need to work out how to hold those, those tensions. I want to present to you very briefly, and we will not be able to deep dive into this, unfortunately. Lundy, this is Laura Lundy. She's from Belfast in Ireland. This model that she put together about participation, this is very well known. Some of you will already be familiar with it. She, she published this in an article called Voice is Not Enough. If you are looking for it, you'll be able to find it on the internet and about a bazillion different articles referencing it. Um, where she wrote down the rights-based approach to, to what is needed for us to ensure that when we do participation opportunities for children, these are the different facets that must be present. It's not just that we've heard the child's voice, which is why the title of this article, Voice, is not enough. We actually also need to make sure we've provided space for the child to be able to form 
you somebody's microphone is just unmuted so whoever that is if it's possible to just check your microphone that would be really great um so we need to make sure and this is i think all of us as practitioners know this idea about informed consent in a way this space component is a part of that we're saying for a child to be able to share their voice we need to have given them a safe and inclusive opportunity to form and express that view but I think for further than that, I want you to think about for a person who has experienced domestic or family of violence, abuse or trauma, there's a trauma layer to this idea of space as well. We need to be able to think about how these children often are unable to detect and respond to the cues of danger or safety, that they, as a result of their experiences, need some support to think about the considerations of physical safety as well as access to calm and containing adult figures. We heard this from Kathy just before. Sometimes the research that Anita Morris showed, sometimes these children will need safe figures with them because their experiences so far have not helped them to understand safety. They have not helped them to be able to orient to space in a way that helps them to feel contained. They need support in relationship to be able to regulate. So the considerations of Lundy's model, which I would posit are a rights-based model for relatively typically developed young people, um, need a trauma layer added to it when we think about it for children who've experienced these experiences of trauma and violence. So getting back to Lundy's model, space, voice, we need to be able to give them an opportunity for the expression of use to be facilitated freely in a medium of choice. I'm going to add to that really briefly again because we've got no time, but I'm going to say to you, please consider voice is not just spoken word. We have a whole host of children and young people for whom speaking is not necessarily easy or comfortable. And I don't just mean because some people have a disability and maybe are not speaking, but we need to consider multiple methods of communication. We might have something like an AAC device for our neurodivergent community, but we might also need to be able to offer multiple methods of delivery. We might need to think about the opportunity not to do this face-to-face, -face, or we need to think about mixed methods when it comes to participatory opportunities. I know some people prefer to do things online, some people prefer to do things in a group environment, some people prefer to do things one-to-one. -to -one. We can't always do that in a risk assessment or in an interview space, but when we're doing participatory work in other ways, we can. So if there are ways that we can do this that are child-centered and we're thinking about what the child needs in order to feel safe and in order to participate so that we can remove the barriers to them, their right to participate, then thinking about how to do that from a, a child-centred perspective means thinking about mixed methods and multiple options for their voice to be able to be offered. The, th the third and fourth ways that Lundy posited were um, from a rights-based perspective were audience. And these are the, the really big ones that I think we miss most often in this sector. It's not just that we, get, we gave the child an opportunity to tell us what they thought, from a rights-based perspective, we actually need to give that voice an audience. And that audience needs to be an audience that has the opportunity to do something about it. If otherwise, it doesn't, the rights, the rights space switch to the legislative space around the right is saying that it has to be able to have an influence. The view must be put on as appropriate. So what we're saying is for this. For this meaningful participation to have ha happened, we need to be committed as a system, as an organisation, as a, as a worker to doing something with this. And this is a, this goes to the heart of one of the another barrier that I think as workers, sometimes we think I, can't, I won't be able to do anything. What if they tell me that they want to live with their dad and we can't do that? Or what if they tell me that they want X, Y, Z and I'm not going to be able to do this? I don't have the power to facilitate that. And then we, because of our fear, we don't engage in that process. Um, there's two layers to that. One is that it, as an organisation, we need to spend some time thinking about how we are going to be able to be sincere about the engagement of children in their processes. But the other is that we also need to get better at holding those conversations that are uncomfortable. We need to be able to say, we've heard you. 
I heard what it is that you want. And these are the reasons why that's not something that we're able to do at this time and have that conversation. But avoiding the conversation is not helping the young person and avoiding the opportunity for them to participate is definitely not helping the young person. It's actually being forming a barrier to their right altogether. Um, and the, the opportunity to have the uncomfortable conversation is also part of their development as well. So I think there's multiple aspects to that. But from a rights-based perspective, the important part is thinking about how can we facilitate all four aspects of participation in this way. On this slide, which I'm not going to unpack, but which I will happily provide a copy of this as a PDF version of the handout. I've seen a few people put that in the chat there. Um, uh, if that's something that the centre are happy to make available, I can see Lisa's nodding. Um, there's just some questions that are designed for you to have a think about. That then to flesh out, if you want to think about this from your workplace perspective, these are some things to think about each of these areas. In this space, what have we done? Have the children and young people been provided with feedback explaining the reasons of the decisions that have been taken? Often what I have seen is that we maybe do a feedback instead of that once a year or every six months. And we, check, we get our feedback and that makes a lovely report, but then we don't really do anything with that feedback or we don't let the young people know what we did with that feedback. Um, or we hear something, but then we don't necessarily, that doesn't really go anywhere. Um, it's, so it's quite important from a rights-based perspective that we actually, there's a, we close that feedback loop. What happens a lot in this sector is that children and young people end up with consultancy fatigue <laughs> because they they might end up being asked for their input. They get we we uh, go to them, we ask them what they think, but then they feel as though nothing ever happens with that. It looks good, maybe to the board. It looks good to a politician. It looks good because they've ticked the box and said they're consulted some young people, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, achieve any important well-being, empowerment or developmental goal. So if you think back to that second slide that I had about the importance of those three things in balance for this group, of, this cohort of young people, we said we needed to be trauma-informed, we needed to be rights-based and we needed to be empowerment-oriented. This is one of the reasons I think this is so important. If we're not thinking about empowering the young people when we start out designing our participatory opportunities, then we can end up at the other end where we've we've maybe achieved a great research goal or we've ticked a great media opportunity, but we haven't ended up with something that is sought to empower young people at the end. And that's got to be at the core. We've got to think about how will this piece of work benefit the young people that we are working with. <clears throat> um, so just quickly, I wanted to highlight some of the barriers. I and mean, this came out of some of that work that I mentioned earlier from my travel. Um, but also it's highlighted lots of times in other people's research as well. Some of the barriers to participation. Um, I Often with, with workers, there's some uncertainty about power sharing. The role feels safer if I don't have to share my power, if I don't have to give you some space to be able to tell me what you want. It feels like I can do it quicker, I can, I can get my job done. Um, Worker-related barriers include fear, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of, of what's gonna happen if I give you participatory opportunities. I, I'm uncomfortable, I'm worried about being uncomfortable with this conversation. Um, I don't have the skill. This is a huge one, actually. I, I think, um, commonly, more commonly than I really would have thought, people feel uncertain about how to talk to children. Um, social workers and child protection workers, this is surprisingly common that people feel really unsure about the skills, the ability to talk to children, to have conversations with children, knowing how to have these sorts of conversations. And so I think building in skills and training about how to engage with children and chat with them something that seems simple on the surface seems to feel like a, a, a stressful or um, discouraging area for a lot of workers 
there's also things like beliefs about childhood and I think this comes back to this conversation I had before about children can be vulnerable and capable do we need to protect children or or can we enable children it's these kinds of polar opposite ideas that we need to tease out assumptions about vulnerability thinking about whether we want to focus on their rights or we need to focus on rescuing them um, and some of the ideas around system related barriers around resourcing um, organizational barriers around whether or not we're supported to do this by management process oriented barriers um, or process oriented supports are there processes at work that enable me to do this or require me to do this is something I'm really interested in as well and then the young person related barriers can be the impact of trauma maybe they're not ready maybe they don't want to engage yet um, or maybe they're not sure how to yet um, a few practice principles and I, I am trying to be super quick here <laughs> um, please prioritize all the elements of safety this means we don't just focus on making sure that um, their physical safety although this is obviously paramount but include please include if you can again this is um, what Kathy said to access to calm and containing adult figures to support co-regulation processes that centre on familiarity, predictability and consistency. Children need services and practitioners that will adopt a stance of cultural humility. This is really important, um, marked and informed by curiosity. Uh, this includes seeking to understand really diverse value systems um, and parenting practices that identify cultural strengths and resources within the child's family and broader network. Um, when services become involved, often the child or parent's needs will be itemised and allocated to multiple services or workers um, and service models which provide integrated, well-coordinated, um, holistic approaches can mitigate the impacts of the isolation and prioritise children's needs as a shared goal. I think that can be quite important. I think sometimes um, kids can get a bit lost in systems, especially um, the family violence system, often what, what can happen, and I know we're trying to change this, but you know, it ends up with seven, six or seven different services being involved and each service has one aspect and the child can end up feeling a bit lost. Um, uh, Again, just as a reminder, and I hope that this is, is something just, just to hold, um, again, children can be both vulnerable and capable. Capable. I hope that you can hold this as a, something to ruminate on, something to think about as you go into um, the week. Please resist the assumption that vulnerability prevents or limits capacity. <laughs> Um, resist the temptation to assume that children under 12 aren't interested. This is another thing that, that I've seen quite a lot of, and particularly that children in the early years can't participate. Kathy, Kathy's agreeing. Yeah. Do you I'm want also, to? I'm just thinking you need to wind up, Lauren. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll wind up. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. And I, uh, as I said, will provide this for everybody else. Thank you. Lauren, thank you so much. I'm sorry to wind you up. Oh, it's fine. So much to say. And I think there's a lot of challenge in speaking for 10 minutes. But it also, is, yeah. But I love, I mean, I just loved, in fact, your opening slide about children are vulnerable in com communities that do not listen to them. Such a powerful thought and just really one to hold on to along with everything else. <laughs> um, that you have said. So thank you very, very much. Thank okay, you. so look, let's, um, without further ado, um, move on to um, talking about um, Jacinta Krakow's um, presentation. And uh, it's great to have you here, Jacinta. Uh, Jacinta Krakow is a Minan, Minan Nunga woman, originally from southwestern, southern west, western Australia, who lives and works on Wurundjeri country in Nam. She's a research fellow in the Health and Social Care Unit at Monash University with expertise in cultural connection for First Nations children and young people 
in out-of-home care. Jacinta is a social worker by background. It's just great to have you here, Jacinta. Um, and th thanks so much for coming along. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Kathy. Um, thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country today, and I just wanted to begin by acknowledging Wurundjeri elders, past and present, and to pay my respects um, to Wurundjeri um, and acknowledge my status as a guest on their unceded lands. So today I'm going to be talking to you um, with a focus on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. And I wanted to really focus on the concept of cultural safety and cultural connection, given that Victoria is now in a context where we're working with child safe standards that include the importance and the principle of cultural safety, where organisations need to establish culturally safe environments in which the diverse and unique identities and experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people and children are respected and valued. And that also includes respect and value for their families as well. So we're thinking about cultural safety in terms of um, a holistic lens on the child and family um, in context. But before I go into talking about cultural safety, I wanted to begin by actually beginning with a focus on childhood and the concept of childhood. And we know that childhood our ideas around childhood have um, changed over time, where we've begun with this idea of children as little adults, with children having to be seen and not heard, to children as, um, as unique members of a society, to childhood as this protected and vulnerable period um, in, in the life course, where we need to actually focus on the importance of childhood as a unique developmental stage. And so that idea of childhood as a unique developmental stage is really evident in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most widely ratified convention in, um, in world history. It was ratified in 1989. And this idea of child rights was really evident in, um, in the, the UNCROC, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, where various rights actually sit in tension with the idea around the need to rescue children from potentially harmful um, circumstances, the idea of risk and what poses a risk to a child, and the rights of the child to be both with the family um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and Indigenous children just generally, the right to actually have your culture respected, to grow up in your cultural environment, but also the right to be free from, um, from violence, abuse or neglect. So we have these rights that inherently sit in tension with one another. And alongside that, they sit in tension with parents' rights and the idea that parents have a right to parent their children to not have the state coercively intervene into their lives, to be free to parent their children in ways that they feel that um, is most appropriate. At the same time, as you know, you're all well and truly familiar, the state also has an obligation to protect children when they are vulnerable. The challenge for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities is that child and family welfare has historically and continues in some ways to be very paternalistic where we have decisions made on behalf and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are not always in our best interests, where the participation and involvement in decision making can actually be quite, um, can be quite coercive, but also disempowering for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in general. Um, where talking to welfare professionals can itself can present a threat and can be quite triggering um, and traumatic. So you also have intergenerational trauma that actually sits behind conversations with welfare professionals, um, whether you're in a child protection context or a family violence context, working alongside police, all of those elements can be triggering um, and threatening for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And in addition to that, you then have a child or a young person who is vulnerable by virtue of their age and stage of development. So you have a double layer of oppression for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people that I think practitioners really need to sit with and reflect on how they can actually come into a circumstance where they're cognizant 
of the fact that just their presence as a welfare worker can be triggering and can be threatening and can be for an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander child an opportunity to actually, um, not necessarily an opportunity, a, a presentation where you actually have been taught not to speak because the child or family welfare practitioner is themselves a threat to the family unit um, and is themselves potentially a threat to the stability of the family. Um, and that's something you learn, I suppose, as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, just through the history of Australia's involvement um, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in various welfare institutions. So that's something that practitioners need to learn not to take personally, but to understand those inherent power dynamics that are at play and are there, that are at play because of Australia's history, not because of individual practitioners, practitioners necessarily or what you do, but because of what you represent. And I think the, the best interest principle, which underpins a lot of child and family welfare practice, tends to be um, quite individual in orientation, and it requires critical reflection and um, requires uh, reflection and attention, I suppose, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. Because Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people don't exist in isolation from the family, community or their culture. So you're actually sitting with a principle that looks at the best interests of the child, but the best interests of the child also sit alongside the interests of the community and the rights of the community, um, particularly when we're thinking about self-determination, to determine our own futures, to determine our own political status, and to determine what is in the welfare and best interests of the community at large. So again, this is another tension that comes into play for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, peoples, the importance of viewing the child in context as a member of the family, as a member of the community, and as having, um, as being part of a collective culture where the collective interests of the community sit alongside the interests of the child. And so with this, there are different conceptualizations of wellbeing and what constitutes cultural safety for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people. And cultural safety inherently is about um, the child's ability to express their own identity, to be free from discrimination, to be um, free from racism, to um, be able to claim their identity and be proud of that identity. And also knowing that their identity is, you know, as a lot of um, theorists sort of talk about in developmental psychology, an ongoing process. So children as learning cultures and learning identities over time, which requires um, a different approach depending on children's age and stage of development, but also an approach that sees cultural safety and cultural connection as lifelong journeys for children and young people. But with this, the importance of actually engaging the family, um, and I'm thinking broadly about the context of family, not just parents, but who was in the extended family, children as um, having aunties and uncles that might be with them to actually facilitate conversations as people to develop rapport with, to develop relationships with children through developing, beginning those relationships with um, grandparents or aunties or uncles. So the importance of, and Lauren spoke about this, not necessarily targeting the child and having those individual conversations with the child in isolation from their family, but, you know, their mothers, um, but also their grandparents might be important to have as people that you need to facilitate relationships with in order to gain the trust of the child or their aunties or their uncles. That can be a really powerful way to actually um, get the, the views and perspectives of the child or young person by actually bringing in the family. So I want to encourage you all to think about working holistically with the whole family and the importance of developing relationships across the family in order to develop those relationships with the child. There is this importance in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities of um, working with the whole family. And I'm thinking here about the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander child placement principle and the importance of participation that works across the child, the young person and the family and the importance of prevention. So working in those ways where we can try to keep the family unit together, 
not just the mother-child dyad, but thinking holistically about the family. Um, and Kathy, have I got a couple of minutes to go? Um, well, just about, you, you are out of time, but maybe take two more minutes. Go. Sure. Thanks, Kathy. That's very fun. Um, I just wanted to quickly say in my PhD research when I spoke to young people about cultural connection and what that meant to them, their agency in deciding what that meant was so powerful and so important. So each child um, or young person at that stage had a story to tell and we're really grateful to have that opportunity to sit and talk. And for many of them, they remarked that this was the first time anyone had ever spoken to them about what cultural connection meant to them and what um, you know was important for them for cultural connection. So I think mm -hmm. in this in adult centric environments where we're tasked with making decisions on behalf of children, we can't ever neglect the importance of involving children in those conversations, but also involving their families in those conversations. And I just quickly wanted to um, reflect on a report by the Office of the New South Wales Advocate of Children and Young People, who found that in addition to children not feeling like they were consulted or spoken to enough, they were also um, a bit disheartened at the fact that their parents were not worked with enough to support them when mm. they had entered out of home care. So their parents were not actually a focus enough of interventions and support. So again, thinking holistically, child and young person in context. And that's my takeaway message. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Jacinda. You know, just uh, such powerful messages there about the child in context and also really thinking through the complexities of cultural safety because we do, I think, just think cultural safety in uh, not necessarily recognising those tensions nor recognising the tensions around the child rights agenda and even um, the, the, um, the convention. The convention is full of contradictions. Um, and so understanding, playing with them and, and grappling with them, you know, I think that your, um, your contributions really highlighted that. I guess too, you know, just how good are these PhD students who have gone forward to be now doctors but who did all this wonderful consultation with children that actually puts their um, puts their thoughts and their knowledge um, onto the agenda in really, really helpful and create a unique contribution to our understanding of knowledge in this space. So thank you, Jacinta. That was terrific. Um, let me move Thanks, on Kathy. to introducing Karen um, and Meg. Karen Piscopia is the Child and Young Person Practice Lead in the Bayside Peninsula area, Orange Door. Karen has over 20 years of experience working within the community services sector across various roles. Meg Pavick is the Child and Young Person Practice Lead at the Orange Door in Gippsland. Meg, Meg has experience working with children who have experienced trauma across numerous, numerous areas of practice. So there's some further bio in the chat. And it's great to have some thoughts and thinking um, from those working in the Orange Door. So thank you very much. Um, and over to you, Karen. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'll just get my information up. So I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm meeting um, you all today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal colleagues that are part of this forum today. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick very quick case study that um, came to um, myself in the orange door and then I'm going to hand you over to Meg for some um, um, just a, a bit of a summary. So just to let you know this case came to the orange door via a referral from a school counsellor following a disclosure by a 17 year old. Just for your information this young person used the pronouns them and they and I'm hoping that this case study will draw on much of what Kathy Lauren and Jacinta have said. The young person at the time was living with their mother, stepfather and two other siblings. The family violence included physical, th physical abuse and threats to both mum and to the young person. There was lots of monitoring of devices, controlling behaviours, to name some of the behaviours. Mum and stepfather were not aware that the referral had been made to the Orange Door. The school counsellor had not informed them. Um, 
So basically, uh, when it came to the Orange Door, it was about, you know, what were our next steps going to be? So firstly, what we did was we contacted the school to determine if it was appropriate to speak with the young person. We spoke to the school counsellor who had a very close relationship with the young person. And we talked about um, considerations like age, um, insight, um, and understanding of looking at that chronological and emotional age, their mental health, their presentation, et cetera. We knew that as an orange door, that under the legislation, we were able to engage with the, the young person in order to complete a risk assessment. But at all times, it was about balancing that with safety. And that was always our paramount consideration for the young person, but also for their family as well. So how were we going to do that? How were we going to engage with the young person? It was always in consultation with the school counsellor and the young person and um, in consultation with the school counsellor who had that connection with the young person. It was agreed that a engagement would take place at school with the school counsellor present and that any contact with a young person would be via the school. At all times, we checked in with the school counsellor to ensure the young, pe young person was okay to proceed and was provided with support both before, during and after any contact that we had. That was incredibly important. We arranged a meeting. We wanted to do an outreach meeting and that was the plan, but unfortunately due to we had to quickly pivot to an online forum and, and making sure that that was okay with the young person as well. At that point in time, we had not made contact with mum um, due to risk factors. One thing that's really crucial when we're making contact and engaging with children and young people is planning. Planning is absolutely crucial. So for us, um, the Todd practitioner, and we had two practice leads involved with this um, particular family, um, we caught up. We spoke about how we were going to engage with a young person. What sort of questions were we going to ask? How were we going to build trust in a very short period of time? What information we wanted to provide, but also what we thought the young person may want. So we really wanted to cover all our bases. And what we knew and what you would all appreciate is that sometimes with, with children and young people, you just get one chance, one opportunity, it's a very small window to be able to engage with a child or young person before they may decide to disengage. And we wanted to, in that very small window, build trust, but also, and provide safety, but also to balance that with gathering information, completing a risk assessment, um, if we needed to provide some psychoed, um, and, and really explaining and building trust for the young person in the service system. Um, just so you know that child protection, because of the other younger siblings in the family, child protection and the police, we were liaising with at different points, but the focus today isn't just in our engagement with the young person. So the meeting took place online. The practitioner was incredible. Um, she had lots of support, which is really important for practice to know that you really reach out for support. She was gentle, used curious questions to engage the young person, very non-judgmental, respectful, really wanting to give messages that the young person was incredibly brave, that their experience was validated and that they were believed. And really importantly, that they were under no pressure to make decisions during that meeting. We looked at safety planning. There had been some safety planning done with, um, with the young person via the school counsellor. But following on from this meeting, we really wanted to strengthen that safety plan. We agreed that following on from that meeting that any further communication would be via the school because of the issues of um, the stepfather monitoring devices. So just to let you know um, a bit of an outcome, the. Um, there was a further incident um, involving the young person in the home um, that saw the mum support the young person um, in that moment. That led to the young person disclosing to mum of the contact that they'd had and, and the disclosure they'd made to the school counsellor and the contact they'd had with the Orange Door. It actually led mum to contact the Orange Door herself, reaching out for support. We were able to link in family violence case management with the young person and um, always giving the young person, the, the young person had the option to be included within that if they wanted. 
there was a full IVO, the stepfather was removed from the home, and the young person was linked into community supports was an incredibly great outcome. So really within this really important to, and points to consider was around having the rationale to speak to the young person, or perhaps you don't have the, the rationale and that's okay as long as we're, we're making attempts to do so. Making the decision to not engage with the parents um, due to safety, due to what the young person was telling us about what may happen if, that was to, if we were to do that. And really working through the community with the school in particular here, at that trusted person in order for us to engage with the young person. Planning, sometimes you only get one chance, a very small window within the orange door or within any agency, and just being really creative with our engagement. So that is the end of the case study. I'm going to now just pass you on to Meg, um, and you can take it from there, Meg. Beautiful. Good morning, everyone. Um, I come to you today from the land of the Gunai Kurnai people and acknowledge the people of the community and the beautiful land that I sit on today. Um, thank you, Karen. I'm um, just reflecting, I guess, on your presentation, firstly, acknowledging the bravery of the young person you spoke of. Um, and additional to that, I think there were numerous points in the life of that intervention where potential barriers emerged. And I think it attests to the dedication and the commitment of those supporting the family that they worked to ensure these factors didn't inhibit that young person's engagement with services in the sector. I think what's advantageous to the Orange Door is that we have the opportunity to start discussions with children and about children at the entry point of the service sector. So right from those very early days after a potentially adverse experience, we have the ability to listen to and validate a child's lived experience, which we all know commences the journey to healing. Historically within the service sector, we have perhaps shied away from directly engaging children in integrated family services or family violence case management services. We've opted to visit mothers while children were at school. We've primarily focused on supporting parents so they can in turn support their children. And whilst there's absolutely merit to this work, what we know is that during times of adversity, transition or trauma, it's unrealistic and also unfair for us to expect that parents be their best parenting selves. By supporting both children and their protective parent, we can support the reformation of the family unit post-family violence, which is something that Cathy touched on the importance of earlier. Capturing the voice of the child, I think, supports us in understanding their unique experience, which is individual to that of other family members. Children are insightful. They have thoughts, feelings and needs that they are able to communicate if we give them the space and opportunity to do so. I think to considering that capturing the voice of the child is not just about listening, it's also about being curious to what the behaviour of the child is telling us. Within the orange door, I've had young children express to me concerns around the family's pet dog left behind when the family fled violence. For that child, the safety of his pet and the concerns around his pet becoming the target of the violence were very real and distressing component of his experience. It was likely contributing to the degree of distress and dysregulation that he presented with. By listening to that child's voice, we were able to have his pet safely collected from the family home and reunited with him. This direct response to his articulate need supported the child to feel heard and supported. We've also had a child articulate concerns around the loss of a special bed, reaching out for reassurance around the instability and uncertainty that they were experiencing. This enabled us to have discussions with the child about next steps for he and his family over the coming days, creating for him a scaffold which provided information, structure, predictability in these uncertain times, which of course enhanced his sense of stability. Ideally, we want the entry point to the Orange Door to provide a foundational template for the work to come with families. By ensuring we commence our engagement by seeing and hearing the experience of children, we support other services in the sector to do the same, and we can set this trajectory. Within the Orange Door, we support all members of the family unit and have the capacity to draw together communities of accessible support around young people by engaging schools, family members, and community linkages. Seeing, listening and responding to children from the point of intake ensures that they are responding, responded to as victim survivors in their own right. Their needs are assessed, their safety considered, their experience validated. 
promoting systemic service system engagement, joint decision-making and accountability, and perhaps most importantly, I think recognition and visibility for children and young people because responding to and supporting children ultimately is everybody's responsibility. Well, thank you very much, Meg and Karen. Um, really appreciate that. Love to hear that attention to pets and understanding that in many households these days that um, pets are part of the family and to not understand the attachment between different family members and their pets is to misunderstand really important aspects of domestic and family violence and the targeting of pets um, by the person um, who's perpetrating violence. Uh, so I think it's a really important aspect that where in fact, I think the practice is ahead of the research and we've worked hard to try and get that um, at least as a bullet point in the um, in the draft plan to end violence against women and children, um, because um, that is providing something of the authorising environment for the years ahead. So um, getting it in there, I think, and, and you highlighting that, I think is uh, really important. Um, great to hear um, the, the complexity of practice and to have a practice example um, really looks to how easy it is um, to either to close down help seeking or to open up help seeking um, as part of the work um, in this space. And I think that notion of planning, planning, planning um, prior to interview um, and prior to talking with children and young people is where it's all at. It doesn't always work, but actually you've got 100% more chance of it working if the planning's put in. So look, with that, spend a few minutes initially whether people have specific questions um, to the speakers. Jacinta talking about really a very complex concept of cultural safety um, and raising the tensions in that space in ways that we um, don't often do. Of Lauren, who talked um, so much about vulnerable that children are vulnerable and capable as well as and can are vulnerable and capable and therefore have agency um, because most of the children we're seeing um, are vulnerable. They have experiences of abuse um, and so recognising that they still have a right to agency um, has been so important. I guess there was my, um, um, my um, presentation as well. So any questions from anyone? And so we've got an open floor, just undo your mic and speak out or else put it in the chat. Um, and Lisa will probably um, raise uh, and put those forward if you don't want to speak. I know when we've got a couple of hundred people that it's hard to go, I want to say something, but please do. Uh, so there's one from Kat. Can Lauren elaborate on seeking views of children under five? <laughs> there you go there's a that's a good tricky one to start off with well done Kat yeah yeah I can um uh, I should also apologize to everybody else for having gone over my time no I, you were fine you know <laughs> thank you I, I just, off, basically <laughs> no, that's I'm, I'm glad you did I forgot to set my timer at the start and I noticed and went uh oh I'm in trouble <laughs> um yeah so Certainly, there's a literature to support the idea that children in the early years are capable and able to participate. They show signs of being able to participate and have view, forming views and show their views when they are engaged in developmentally appropriate ways. And so I'm thinking particularly if you go looking for it, you can find some writing on this by Gerison Lansdowne. She's quite a well-known children's rights writer. Um, talking about children in the under five years and their ability to participate and the, the importance of supporting that, but also even nonverbal children, um, as in I'm not talking about children who, uh, for developmental reasons, older than, say, two years of age. I'm talking about children in those very early years um, in uh, under two years of age. Um, that they are also able to show their their preferences, their interests, their whether or not they turn toward or away. They are able to show um, participatory uh, inclination <laughs> towards different things. If we show that, 
if we give them opportunities to show um, whether or not they want to be involved in things or not involved in things. So there are ways of being able to gauge whether children or young people want to participate in things. They can show um, decision-making ability in different ways. Uh, sorry, yes, the author that I mentioned there was Jerison Lansdowne. Lansdowne is L-A-N-S-D-O-W-N. Um, there are definitely more than that and I'm having a little mental blank being put on the spot um, I will try and think about uh, a couple of other names and pop them in the chat I, they'll probably come to me as soon as I'm not talking and having to think about them on the spot uh, but maybe some of the other panelists will also think about um, some as well um, but yes there's there's uh, no reason not to think about children under the age of five or six, it's really more about thinking about ways to engage them and not relying on literacy-based tools that um, we may be used for children who can read. I know at um, the Australian Children Foundation, uh, you know, we used to have a bunch of tools that we used that were mostly literacy-based and that was one of the barriers. And then we had to have a rethink and design a whole bunch of new ones that were maybe symbols based or picture based thinking about our skills as practitioners to use relationally based tools and then we also developed a children's feedback tool that had boys soft engagement things squishy sensory things fidget oriented things um things that were uh far more accessible for other people i think a Brings us on to another question from Molly George. I'm interested in some of the methods you've used to garner the perspectives of young people beyond words. Um, my experience is with pictures or activities, but would love to hear more about this. I guess, you know, it does raise the issues around actually some, to make this a process of reciprocity can be very important, both to children, but also to the gatekeepers for children, whether that's their mothers or workers, they want to make sure that children get something out of this. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a researcher in this area, you know, what are the methods? Then, you know, there were digital story opportunities provided by Katie Lamb, mm -hmm. and these young people made digital stories that then are being used in men's behaviour change programs or in training um, mm -hmm. about fathering. That for Anita Morris, she ran a circus, she got someone to run a circus skills workshop um, for these children at the time, same time as they were being interviewed, you know, the, there was a little run through um, around those sort of issues. I've just um, been given a really um, interesting thesis to mark, which is actually about a validated tool called joint painting procedure, which is about working with mothers and children together and the mother child strengthening and as a tool that's a research tool as well as um, a, a tool that made a really difference, a big difference. So very interesting work done by um, Rainbow Ho from Hong Kong around joint painting procedure, which is a validated tool in this space. So just some really interesting things. So Jacinta, I'm not sure whether you want to speak um, further about this or Karen and me. I think sometimes just children having the space, as Jacinda said, to be heard is really, really important um, and that's all they need. Sometimes there's a greater reciprocity that can also um, be involved. And there's one here about how can we encourage non-ASTI parents, uh, non-Aboriginal um, parents um, as well as um, ch uh, uh, um, Aboriginal children to understand the importance of cultural connection and identification. So just into potentially that's one for you, I think. Sure, thanks, Kathy. Um, so I suppose it's about two things. Firstly, recognizing that racism does exist within um, the family unit and that non-indigenous parents can actually perpetuate racism against their children. A really good example of that was actually from my PhD research where um, an Aboriginal young person was talking about the racism that she used to receive by her non-Indigenous dad, who would say comments like, do you like the smell of petrol when they're at the gas station because she's Aboriginal, therefore, you know, insinuating that, you know, all Aboriginal people 
um, sniff petrol, who would denigrate her Aboriginal identity and tell her that she didn't have enough Aboriginal blood in her to count, um, to telling her that she shouldn't tick the Aboriginal box because she's not really Aboriginal, she's only part, which are all racist things to say to an Aboriginal um, child or young person, and which actually did cause her a lot of identity confusion. <clears throat> so it's one, recognising that racism, you know, is insidious in Australian society that does exist within the family unit. And it's two, encouraging non-Indigenous parents to actually go on their own journeys of understanding their own ethnocentrism. So why they think, how they think about Aboriginal identity and cultures. <laughs> Um, to then learning more about the history, um, about what the stolen generations has in effect produced for Aboriginal people's identity today, um, what colonisation has produced, and to then trying to challenge those understandings. So I think um, Lauren mentioned it before, taking an approach that's actually about cultural humility and lifelong learning. And that's an approach that practitioners need to take when working with non-Indigenous parents of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander children as well. So encouraging that, role modelling that yourself, um, perhaps trying to avoid judgment um, can be really powering because you don't want to put the parent on the back foot, but you also want to role model what it means to actually um, go on that journey yourself to challenge preconceptions and ideas, and importantly, to work with the child, because the child will make their own decisions about their culture and their identity, regardless of what their parents necessarily tell them. Um, that was really evident in my own research that even when they had parents as negative influences, children knew when those relationships were not healthy and not good for them and they would decide not to engage in those relationships. They would choose how to enact their own um, cultural connections. So work with the child, be respectful in your relationships with the parent, but role model that good practice around cultural humility. Thanks, Jacinta. Um, so there's this other one about, has there been any research looking at what is the best length of time to be involved with supporting the young person? What are the views of young people about this? So I think no easy answer to that. And there isn't definitive research around that. Um, you know, if you think about Eva Alisic's work with uh, young people bereaved um, because their um, parents, their mother's been murdered. You know, she's been working with, um, a survivor, um, Catherine Joy, as part of our research team in that space. Now, you know, young people whose mothers have been murdered, you know, they need support at different points in their life all the way along. Um, that there's times when they feel like they're doing well and there's other times when they're not doing well at all and really need an enormous amount of support. And I think that you can point that out to, you know, that would be the case with most young people so that you know, you can have programs of work. You know, if you look at um, Wendy Bunston's work, some of those uh, group work programs made a very significant difference to children over a period, I think, of 12 weeks. Um, the Children, Mothers in Mind, again, a program with a, a limited time frame showed that there was um, a difference made to the lives of both the children as well as the women involved in those processes. But things surface all along the way as part of children's development. So I don't think you can have anything definitive to say what works and for how long. Um, so here's another one. If any of the panelists, whoa, I'm gonna, would any of the, would, would speak about children that are victim survivors of that have been removed and are in foster or kinship care to ensure their voice is heard in engaging in access visits with parents, with the parent that was the perpetrator. as And as workers, what can we do to advocate for them when they do not wish to engage in these visits? <gasps> what an important question. Okay, does anyone want to run with that from our team? Karen or Meg? Lauren? I guess maybe um, advocacy is the key. It's making sure that your voice as a practitioner is, is loud and is heard on the behalf of the child. It might be about considering um, having an independent child advocate 
recruited so that the child's voice is, is recognised and considered. Um, it's absolutely, though, I acknowledge a really tricky space because we will often hear this. We will often hear children articulating that they're not wanting to, to have access with the offending parent at that time. Um, and a really uncomfortable place that I hear lots of practitioners talking about as well, sitting in a similar position perhaps as you are. I think that documentation is key as well, but I don't think that we emphasize, emphasize and I guess one of the things um, about working with the Safe and Together model has been over a period of time over the different five projects we've worked with together with practitioners and their senior managers, and, you know, there's been about a 1,000 over um, over a five-year period is an increasing attention to documentation and making sure that the documentation clearly articulates and identifies the harm to the child created by the domestic violence perpetrator and making sure that that is clearly documented. And I guess under the Safe and Together website, there's quite a lot of direction and um and details about how one might um, track and document, um, particularly using the um, perpetrator map mapping tool. So some, I think that this is the, uh, the most difficult space to be working in. And we certainly, in most of the children's courts, if you're going back to the children's court, you just must have um, some documentation and evidence to go back to say that these, um, contact arrangements are not working for the child um, and some of the courts are more sympathetic than others within Victoria but also I know we've got people from across Australia um, it's a really big issue not just for the family court but when we're looking at um, children um, children out of home care we are looking um, very much at uh, at the children's court and again I think there's there's work that needs to be done there. But um, some other issues. Um, thank you, Pri. You can follow me on what is the age limit for a young person to work with the orange door? For example, what is the youngest you can work with without talking to the parents or guardian? Um, orange door people, Karen and Meg. That's a question we get asked all the time, I think, when, you know, what is the age that you can or you can't speak to a child or young person? Um, and I think it, it makes it very easy for practitioners if there's an age, um, but there isn't an age. Um, it's an incredibly grey area with regards to, you know, when we speak to a child or young person and lots of factors come into account. Um, like that case example I showed you, it's around age, it's around chronological versus emotional age, taking those into consideration. It's around disabilities. Um, it's around levels of insight. It, there is no hard or fast rule. It's, it's always, you know, I think it's always ideal that we bring parents along and we're, and we're transparent, but that's not always the case. Um, within the Orange Door, quite often we have parents that um, we can't get in contact with or they decline. Um, but then we're thinking about, well, how are we going to give that voice um, that child a voice. So it's a really, there is no age. I can't give an age. Um, Meg, Meg, what are, you, are your thoughts? Did you want to add to that? I think it's about considering creatively what we can do if, if we're in the event that we're not able to independently engage a child, can we then rally the support networks or the other community networks that are in place for that family to, I guess, promote them doing that work? So it's around um, really troubleshooting those barriers and, and if it's not our role or if it's not within our capacity at that point, at that juncture, to have those independent conversations or who else exists within that community of supports around that child that can do that work. I think it links to one from um, Georgina who says, thank you, all presenters. Have you encountered resistance to child rights discourse and approaches, for example, the Lundy model, particularly on the context of ongoing tensions between vulnerability, um, protection and participation. I think, you know, it does link to what you've just been saying. And let's face it, there is really a, a the domestic violence, domestic family violence thrives on secrecy. And so there's a lot of shame about the exposure of families um, because it often feels like it's not just the exposure 
of the person using um, violence, but it feels like the exposure of the whole family. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a very, uh, it isn't a simple space. It's easy to say. Um, it's easy to say there's a discourse in this space. The practice around it is much harder. Lauren, go. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, yes, I would totally agree. And I would also say, yes, I've experienced a lot of reaction to the topic of children's rights in general. Lots of people don't like using the frame of children's rights. They don't like using the term children's rights. In fact, I've had people ask me not to use it as a, a title in presentations to avoid using it as the foundation of a presentation. They want to talk about participatory practice but not use children's rights as part of it. Um, and I think there seems to be within Australian culture the idea that somehow to talk about children's rights means that we are taking away parents' power, um, that somehow we're making less of parents' rights. <laughs> Um, and I think that there's this idea of, you know, parental power being all important. And I think that intersects very strongly, Kathy, with this idea about family violence and privacy, domestic violence, the idea of what happens in the home as a private thing. Um, and I think it's a really important discourse to unpack because it's, it's really not helpful. It's not helpful in the context of family violence. It's not helpful in the context of domestic violence. And it's definitely not helpful to, in the context of children and childhood. And it comes back to those ideas of how we understand children, who are children, and, and what is their role in society. Do we talk about them and do we listen to them? And if we talk about them and we listen to them, we cherish them, we think they're valuable members, citizens already fully developed and part of our construct of what an important part they are in com community, then we're likely to approach this whole thing very differently. I think that um, children's rights is such an important part of this discourse because we see them as having the right to being part of this society. We see them as having the right to being able to participate in decisions that impact them. And if we see them that way, then we see them as being able to also influence other areas as well. And that will start to drive change. Um, that said, because there is this pushback, because there is this misunderstanding that it means that we don't also see parents as having rights, we sometimes need to hold these tensions all the time. We need to be able to hold the idea that parents also need to have their hand held and we need to talk about this idea that it doesn't mean that parents don't still have responsibility. Children have rights, parents have responsibility. They go hand in hand. Thank you very much, Lauren. I think that's just an excellent way for us to be able to finish this forum. I think this notion of and not ex, not um, of problematizing this space, to embrace the space, but to also problematize it is a really important aspect of all this um, work that people have been involved in. There's a load of questions left, and so I'm really sorry that we haven't got to them. Um, it's been a fantastic forum, and I really want to thank everyone for their contribution, to Jacinta, to Lauren, to Karen, to Meg. Really want to thank you so much. Um, and to say there's clearly so much more discussion to have in this space, and I want to thank um, and appreciate Family Safety Victoria for supporting the forum and um, for the Centre for Child, um, for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare um, for putting it on for us. So thank you, everybody. Um, very much appreciated um, and great to be with you all on this really important topic. So bye for now. Thank you.